So apparently the Germans found that effect and were trying to make it into a wonder weapon, vengeance weapon. They were finally spinning mercury in rotating electromagnetic fields. The problem is the mercury gets hot, vaporizes. They were doing these experiments underground tunnels. All the staff inhaled mercury vapor and went insane and died. So Tesla was right all along. He actually had his own unified field theory. He wasn't big on mathematics. He was more like a guy who walked in the lab and did stuff. So we don't understand his concepts. He never really wrote down a scientific article and published it. He just talked about it. He said it's possible to change gravity with electromagnetism. He also criticized Einstein's theories, he says. There's no such thing as relativity and stuff like this. Quantum mechanics. He didn't believe in quantum mechanics. He didn't believe in even Einstein's theory of relativity. Einstein and Tesla were actually alive at the same time. They actually met once. And the picture of them standing next to each other shows that neither of them were happy to be standing next to each other. They did not get along. Oh, here's a really interesting piece of history that will maybe come out eventually. During World War II, they hung big electric cables around ships and pulsed them with alternating current to demagnetize them. So they didn't have any steady magnetic field. It was magnetic field was oscillating. This was to protect them from these fancy German mines that the Germans had invented. You didn't have to hang mines on the chains with the big spike, you know, the ball with this fuses hanging out each side, so if the ship ran into it, this would go off when the ship passed close by because of the magnetic field. And so they hung these big coils, they put up these big generator sets on these ships so that they could sail in places where, because U-boats would actually lay minefields under the sea. Nobody knew they were there until you tried to run a ship through there. The British found this so the hard way. So they were demagnetizing the ships using these big electromagnetic fields around the ships. Okay. Now, they'd also invented radar. Tesla wants to help with the war effort. He says, I have an idea that'll not only hide the magnetic field of the ship, it'll hide its radar signature. You can make the whole ship disappear from radar. And he was an expert at making plasmas, it's Tesla coins. So he apparently came up with this experiment where they mounted a bunch of Tesla coils on this ship and made a bunch of plasma around it, and they got it to disappear from radar because the radar would be absorbed by the plasma rather than bouncing back. Okay, it's the middle of a war. We're fighting a war. If we can make ships disappear from radar, that would be a good thing. The Germans and Japanese couldn't see us coming because both the Germans and Japanese had figured out radar too from the British. Okay, so they put a bunch of Tesla coils on top of this ship, and it's just a minesweeper or something. It's not really a destroyer or anything. It's just a small warship that they had available. So they turn on all the Tesla coils. The ship it doesn't just disappear from radar. It disappears. That's the story. It disappears completely. It's just the Philadelphia experiment? This is the Philadelphia experiment. And you know, there's a whole folklore about that. And everything about the story makes sense, except what happened when they turned on the Tesla coils. They made the ship disappear, supposedly, then it reappeared with guys still trapped in the deck plates and stuff like this. Five sailors got killed. The story I heard was the effect on Tesla, who was an old man at that point. He was just devastated that people had gotten killed as this experiment. Nobody had ever gotten killed in any of these experiments. This experiment had gone completely wrong. Weird shit had happened that he didn't expect. And they say they actually called in Einstein, who was then in the United States, to have him look at the results, to try and figure out what had happened. They didn't know what had happened. Tesla didn't know what had happened. 
And Einstein looked at it, he, and the best they could come up with is the, the ship went out of a dimensional porthole into another dimension and then came back when they shut off the power. Anyway, in the context of World War II, in the context of what Tesla had done with his life work, and also Einstein's interest in unified field theory and stuff like this, the whole premise of the story makes a lot of sense. The only thing that doesn't make sense is the reports of what happened. And, and they say that Einstein and Tesla, even though they didn't like each other, were forced to kind of work together. Now, Tesla died shortly thereafter. Apparently, the stress of this, and especially they say that he was brokenhearted over the deaths of these sailors, that he died. It killed him, basically. And here's the other wrinkle to the story. Donald Trump's uncle was in charge of the FBI team that came to Tesla's apartment and took everything, everything. They took the toilet paper off the rolls because he's written stuff on the toilet paper while he was sitting on the can. You know, they took everything. And it's still locked up someplace. It's locked up with the Ark of the Covenant, you know, that big warehouse they show at the end of the Raiders Laws. I love that movie. And so anyway, but that's the story. So now if you use Tesla fields, the rotating electromagnetic field, and we use them all the time in every induction motor we have, unless you want to generate really high torque at low speeds, you don't use brushes in motors anymore. It's all induction. It's just a piece of metal spinning in a spinning electromagnetic field because they last a lot longer. Brushes wear out. I mean, they're carrying all this electricity. They're brushing against mm -hmm. each other's friction. You don't want that. No. Maybe if you got an automobile starter motor, you use brushes in it, DC or even AC, because that's got to produce a lot of torque at low speed. And the induction motor likes to just spin at the same speed all the time or you can actually adjust the speed. You create a rotating electromagnetic field of a certain frequency, spinning at a certain frequency. If you speed up the frequency, the, the rotor turns faster. So that was invented by Tesla. Now, as it turns out, that's the secret to making electromagnetic flight. You can modify gravity fields with those kinds of spinning fields. That's what my theory says. And I have published it. DARPA gave me money to study it. And I did. I improved the theory. Imagine a living room where you've got a hole in the wall and you hang a painting over it so nobody will notice. Well, I was able to actually take the painting down and plaster up the hole and, and paint it so it actually looks nice. Now, then I hung the painting back to where it was because I like the painting. But Anyway, so DARPA gave me money to do research, but one of the stipulations of their research, by the way, Dr. Brandenburg, we don't want you doing any experiments. No experiments. All theory. So then I did the theory, showed that it worked. They took the report and said, thank you very much, Dr. Brandenburg. You've been very helpful. I've never heard from him since. But at the same time, no bunch of guys in trench coats have said, Brandenburg, we got a free bus ticket to Site 51 for you. We got a nice place for you to stay there. Say goodbye to your friends. You won't be seeing them for a while. You're going to Site 51. <laughs> Does that actually guess, happen? Does that really actually happen? It could. It could. And what's interesting, I, I write science fiction, and one of the reasons I write science fiction is it gives me ideas. I came up with an idea from writing a science fiction short story, and I realized, oh, my God, I could build one of these things. So I built it, and it worked. And the government gave me some money for a while. I actually made, you know, I brought in about a million dollars worth of contract money on it to make it work. And, and showed that it would work really well. And then they said, Dr. Brandberg, you can't work on this anymore. Please give us your reports and don't work on it anymore. And don't ask us for any more money to work on this idea. And 
I said, yes, sir. They'd taken the program black. And it started with a science fiction story that I wrote first. It, we were having a writing class, and we were all supposed to write a short story. So I wrote a science fiction short story as part of the class. Mm -hmm. And it turned into a million-dollar physics program at the private aerospace companies I worked for. I got money for two different big projects. I was showing the results of one of the experiments I'd done. And there was an Air Force colonel visiting our facility. It, this was in Wisconsin. I was working at a company in Wisconsin. And we were all supposed to kind of present to this colonel what we were doing. So I showed him this and that. You know, I was working on plasma propulsion. And then I showed him a picture of this experiment that we'd done. Basically, just using the fact we had a nice vacuum chamber and everything. Like this. And he looked at it. And he says, oh, oh, take that picture down. He says, you can't work on that anymore. And I was being funded by the Air Force. In fact, it was the third big contract I got it from the Air Force. And he says, oh, you can't work on that anymore. And I can't tell you why. And so what had happened is the program had gone black. Some people like my idea so much that they took what I invented. And I hope it works really well. My science fiction is rather blood and guts and swashbuckling. Beautiful dames uh, wearing tight-fitting spacesuits and battles in space using lasers and nuclear weapons and stuff like that. Yeah, I write serious science fiction. So anyway, that has happened to me. They didn't take me away to Site 51, but they did tell me, you can't work on this idea anymore, and don't ask us why. So I know that happens, and I know one guy who went to prison because he worked on some stuff that the government didn't like. They told him not to work on it, but he kept working on it, and he hired an Iranian graduate student to help him work on it. And the FBI showed up and arrested him. He's in prison now. He got the tap on the shoulder, as they call it, and he didn't pay any attention. I knew the guy. He's kind of one of these guys who doesn't change his mind easily about stuff. Not only did he keep working on it, he hired an Iranian student, visiting an Iranian student to work on it. Yeah, that's the problem right there. Oh, the oh yeah. Well, probably this, wasn't, this wasn't just a student. He was probably an Iranian Oh, absolutely. And, uh, and, absolutely. Right. We all know how the game's played. And uh, gathering intelligence using graduate students from foreign intelligence agencies using graduate students to gather. This happened in World War II. They had all sorts of Germans studying in this country, and then they went back to their own country, and they took all the American ideas with them and stuff like that. So, uh, yeah, there were a lot of people of German descent who decided to go back to Germany to fight for Germany during World War II. Remember the Norden bomb site? It was a special bomb site they invented with a small computer in it for high level bombing. B 17s, B 24s. They used the Norton bomb site. It would compensate for wind speed and everything like this. So you could put bombs more precisely on target. That was highly classified. My father flew on a bomber with a Norton bomb site. He was the guy directed to destroy it if the plane started going down. They actually had a destruct thing that you had to unscrew this thing and push this button and then get up, get the hell out. And it would, you know, thermite charge would melt everything. And he was supposed to do that before he got out of the plane. If it went down. And as it turns out, the secret to the Norden Borm site had been worked on partly by this one German American. And he went back to Germany, told the Germans all about it. So that sort of stuff happened. That sort of stuff happened in World War II. And it's been happening ever since. So anyway, no one has done that to me. And I'm always prepared that somebody will come up and tap me on the shoulder and say, John, Dr. Brandenburg, we don't want you talking about this anymore or working on this anymore. And that's just part of being in the business. In fact, when I found out there had been a nuclear holocaust on Mars, I reported it to the Defense Intelligence Agency. 
I knew they had a Mars desk there. Don't ask me how, but they did. And they sent a guy over and he listened to my briefing on it, took a lot of notes. And then six weeks later, they came back with the message, publish it. And so I was fully prepared for the fact that they would just say, Dr. Brandon, we don't want you talking about this to anybody. And, and I, I would have understood that because I worked on classified stuff all the time. And I took it very seriously. I knew that the decision to classify certain things is above my pay grade. I understood that. And even on now, this. Yes. Now, now with this anti-gravity propulsion, Yes. How does get back to the, the manipulation the, of, of space time figure into this? I.e. Well, space, time the space the curvature like that. the curvature of space time that's gravity. The fact that space time is curved around the Earth by the mass of the Earth that is what we call gravity. So space time geometry, the curvature of the space time geometry. That is what creates what we call gravity. Now, most of that gravity is very weak, but in the case of a black hole where you can have a star that burns out all its fuel, collapses on itself, nothing can finally stop its collapse. It just disappears, basically. All is left is the gravity field. And that's space-time curvature at very extreme but that's not what we see most of the time. We land on Mars, we land on the moon, weak gravity curvature. We're orbiting the sun, weak gravity curvature. That's what we call gravity. But it's space-time curvature. Now, because space-time has a geometry, we can actually manipulate that geometry. Let's say we had very powerful electromagnetic fields, much more powerful than are needed to just fly around. I hope that both of us will see at some air show in the next couple of years, one of our own flying saucers flying as is just a demonstration. It'll have big American flags on the side so that people won't shoot at it when they see it. And they'll just say, here we are. We're flying around in this flying, you know, it'll be Air Force or Navy flying around in this flying saucer for, you know, they'll do a flyby for the crowd. So I think we have the technology to do that now. In fact, there's suspicion that the Germans had actually figured out how to do this in the final years of World War II, and that that was confiscated by the U.S. government. But the Germans considered it their most secret. You know, they had an atomic bomb program. Thank God they put Heisenberg on char in charge of the, the uncertainty principle. He was a real physicist, and he looked on it as a physics problem, not as a strategic war problem. And he was uncertain. Heisenberg was uncertain as to how to actually proceed to the building of an atomic bomb. They actually spent more money on the V-2 rocket program than we spent on the Manhattan program. Give you some idea of how desperate Nazi Germany was. So they had another program going on, a gravity modification. The person that was considered their most important project Einstein started working on his unified field theory while he was still in Germany, and he was still a very, you know, he's a rock star. So if he's working on unified field theory, a lot of people, that's what inspired Kaluza and Klein, who do their work on it. So the Germans knew all about that, and as it turns out, if you do experiments where you spin gyroscopes in a lab with Tesla three-phase power and measure their weight very carefully, something you wouldn't do unless you were really looking for something, you measure a small weight loss when the gyroscope spins up. And then here's the interesting thing. It only works if you spin the gyroscope in a counterclockwise direction. If you spin it in the clockwise direction, it doesn't do anything. Figure that one out. That's quantum mechanics. Is that because it's working against gravity versus working with gravity or something like that? Well, you'd think that it would, if you were, one direction would give you less gravity because the things weigh, they lose about a couple milligrams of weight. They weigh about 100 grams. And they, 
lose a couple milligrams. By the way, they have sensitive chemical scales that can measure those sorts of things. And they even had them in World War II, especially the Nazi government. Mm -hmm. Germany was the center of science before World War II. So you can do that. And then when you spin the direction so it's in the opposite, the spin vector is in the opposite direction, pointing down instead of pointing up, you don't get any effect. <laughs> so uh, some Japanese guys named Yamaguchi and Hamasaki repeated this experiment that had actually been reported in a Russian scientific journal. Mm -hmm. This peculiar thing where you would lose weight spinning in one direction and no weight change in the other direction. So they repeated it, and they published it in Fizzrev Letters, big prominent scientific journal. Immediately, immediately, someone came out with a study saying there's nothing to this. We rotated a gyroscope and got nothing. Mm -hmm. Turns out they used compressed air to spin the gyroscope, not Tesla three-phase fields. Instead of using, they, there's no electricity involved. They use just spinning, they use compressed air turbine to spin. And I would talk to people. I said, well, look, we did. It. So we got actually some money from a bunch of UFO people to repeat the experiment. We got the exact same result. It wasn't hard to see. If you were looking for it, you could find this. So apparently the Germans found that effect and were trying to make it into a wondered weapon, vengeance weapon. They were finally spinning mercury in rotating electromagnetic fields. The problem is the mercury gets hot, vaporizes. They were doing these experiments in underground tunnels. All the staff inhaled mercury vapor and went insane and died. The Germans, well, they're losing 30,000 men a day in Stalingrad. They don't care about human life anymore, even of their own people. So they figured out how to do the experiments more safely. Finally, the Russians are approaching. The story is they actually figured out how to do anti-gravity, but they couldn't power it. There was nothing available to power such a craft. Best thing they had was a rotary airplane engine connected to a generator. And that was so heavy that if the thing could fly, it could only carry its own weight couldn't carry any payload or anything like that in fact i the joke goes that they found out they could do this by powering a generator to make three-phase rotating power tesla fields using a rotary airplane engine and one of their aerodynamics engineers said why don't we just connect the engine to a gearbox and make it turn a big propeller it'll fly a lot better because the copper, you know, the, the copper is really heavy. So they all they had was copper to work with. So they say that Hans Kamler, the SS general in charge of this whole operation, heard the Russians approaching from the east, the Russian army. So they abandoned the facility. He had all of the people write a big report on their progress. Then the SS took all the people on the project out to a field and massacred them all. But he had the report. So when the Americans showed up, he said, I'll trade you this report for a plane ticket to Argentina. And they say that's what happened to him. He disappeared. I mean, everybody was looking for him. He was a notorious mass murderer. And somehow he managed to escape both the Americans and the Russians. They think that he came to the American side like Werner von Braun. One of Rembrandt said, take us captive and we'll show you how to build the uh, rockets. And that's what America did. They brought them to the United States. And they launched, were launching V-2s for the American government and later moon rockets. But Hans Kamler, he got a plane ticket to Argentina. So when because are we going to see? traded them the report on this Nazi anti-gravity program. So when are we going to see this stuff? Oh, craft. Well, I spoke of the value of having a sense of humor 
in this situation, we have the government with a big secret, a whole bunch of secrets, in fact, all of them revolving around the UFO stuff. If you find a dead civilization on Mars, oh, you can't talk about that because that, I have a character in my book is telling the heroine, there's this beautiful Asian American woman named Cassandra Chen. She says, well, why don't the government talk about this stuff on Mars? She says, you found it. He says, because the Mars bone is connected to the UFO bone. If the Mars bone goes, the UFO bone goes. And if the UFO bone goes, the head of this government will fall off, he says. <laughs> so here's the thing. The fact that the U.S. government has figured out the secret of anti-gravity, or really, you know, the principle. The principle, all the principle, well, actually, I think they have the engineering now. I think they've got, if you throw enough money at it, try enough stuff, and they have enough smart people, and they turn it over to engineers. They don't turn it over to string theorists, figure out how to run things like that. They give it to some good electrical engineers and tell them, solve this problem. They do that. Okay. So people will ask them, gee, that craft looks very familiar. It looks like a flying saucer. Government says, no, it doesn't. <laughs> then you ask, where'd you get the idea for this thing? Never mind. They either got to say, oh, we traded the idea from a SS mass murderer for a plane ticket to Argentina. That's one story they could say. The other story is, oh, the, we, sh we shot down some UFOs and rescued this technology out of the wreckage. There, that's the other story. They don't want to say either story. Now, by the way, you know what they can say? Oh, we got these really smart guys like Brandenburg and put off. They figured it out for us. We just used their theories. Fine. I have told people that I realize I am, in some sense, the clueless tool of the U.S. government in all of this. But that's fine. I'm just, hey, that's part of when you sign up for service. I wasn't in the military, but I was serving in the defense of the United States. Yes, you are the clueless tool of the U.S. government. Yes, sir. No, sir. Very well, sir. <laughs> Have you ever been approached by the Russians or the Chinese? Very obliquely, I think. And I was waiting for something like that to happen. Conferences. I always try to be friendly to everybody. That's, you know, but I don't want to go visit Russia and lecture on this. I certainly don't want to go to China and lecture on this. Maybe that my plane ticket there is, just becomes a one way ticket rather than. Hey, I used to work on all sorts of classified programs. I, I can't go traveling to right. hostile foreign countries. I'm You're afraid probably not even, even a lot. There's probably a, you probably have a restriction anyway. Oh, oh, I'm sure I do. Even though my clearance has long since lapsed. In fact, they, they asked me, they said, do you want to keep your clearance? And I said, I'm going to go teach at a university in Florida with people from all over the world as students there. I don't want to be considered to be part of this program anymore. That would be, you know, I'm going to try and forget everything, all the details of everything I learned here. The program on anti-gravity, I heard one guy say, we were working on this program for the government, and they told us not even to think about it when we were off duty. Fine. Good. You know, that's the way you do it. And it's been a great experience, and I got a lot of papers published. I got people mad at me. So I consider it a great compliment. And I just got a new journal article accepted in a scientific journal in India, which is India is now turning into a scientific superpower. Yeah, they uh, just sent a probe to the moon, right? Oh, and it worked beautifully. Beautiful. Unlike the Russians who were just crashed into it. Oh, it's so sad about what happened to the Russian probe. They said it had a software error. Somehow somebody uploaded something, some wrong command to the, you know, the computer on board, the thing got a virus somehow. That's a terrible thing. Very regrettable. You know, it did make a nice new crater on the moon. We'll name the crater after the project head in, uh, 
In fact, they say the head of that project mysteriously has passed away. I think he fell out a window or something. He was looking at the moon, fell out the window. It's a shame. It's a terrible thing to hear. So, yeah, this stuff is very serious. And so I just got a big article published in India, and I'm very pleased with the theory, very pleased. And I do mention in the uh, article that you can modify gravity with electromagnetism, that my theory predicts this. That's my big prediction. Now, I happen to know, or let's say I happen to suspect that this has already been demonstrated. We saw a very spectacular UFO over my hometown when I was just in seventh grade. It got written up in the newspaper. Everybody saw it. Mm -hmm. And it was during the same episode that resulted in the swamp gas reports from in Michigan. Yeah. Michigan. You know, yeah. You didn't, what you saw was swamp gas with corrugated uh, metal surface, you know, stuff like this. You know, yeah. <laughs> What was really confusing to me, let me put it this way. When I read the Condon report, they ended Project Blue Book. And I had heard about the first animal mutilation reports. And I thought, you know, I'm just in high school. I thought if people came from outer space, they would never do something. I kind of went into denial about the whole thing. I thought, well, they've taken care of that. That's not a problem. That's not something I need to worry about. And I refused to think about it for many years because of that. Snippy the horse convinced me that there was nothing to the UFO thing. So I went into denial myself. I said, if people from outer space came and did that, that doesn't make any sense. Therefore, they can't be from outer space. This whole thing is some kind of weird hoax. And then when I went to Lawrence Irmore National Lab, we were bunch of graduate students we're just interested in getting our phds and getting out of there getting a good job and buying a nice house for our wives that was our big goal and i like to say that they told me the world was flat at livermore and that i should stay away from the edges meaning you know watch your p's and q's around here brandon they actually called us together at one incident in like 1975 and said if anybody asks you if warp drive is possible from other star systems you say no it's against the law it's against the law of relativity and we all actually were sitting there munching our donuts and drinking our coffee as we we're listening to this five minute statement the head of this physics lecture was by the head of our department he says anybody asks you about warp drive you say no it's against the law Warp drive, of course, was a big feature in Star Trek. And we all looked at each other and we actually said, why would they tell us not? Why are we become shills for the government saying that there is no such thing as, but we're all graduate students, so we just didn't talk about it. Warp drive? No, not possible. And I realized later they didn't want anybody talking about UFOs at Livermore. And we were told as graduate students not to talk about it. That was the hidden message. Of that. We know that if there's UFOs, extraterrestrials, they can't come from the solar system. Therefore, they have to have warp drive. And if you don't believe in warp drive, then there can't be any extraterrestrials visiting this place, can there? They certainly wouldn't live in this solar system. And we know they. if anybody lives in another solar system, they can't get here. So that was what we were told. And it was like, we're a bunch of mafia button men sitting in a room, and the chief capo comes in and says, uh, there is no warp drive. Capiche? Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, boss, capiche. It's a forbidden subject. We don't talk about that no more. And we don't talk about Angela... Angela Gambolini, who's running around with the big boss. We don't talk about her either, right? Kabish? Yeah. Yes, boss. You got it. There is no such woman. <laughs> we all wanted to finish our PhDs and get out of there. It was hard work. 
we're getting paid not a lot and my poor wife was working and i was working at the lab and we were getting by but just barely i told her i said i'm finished my phd i'm gonna get out of here i'm gonna get a good job and buy a nice house i told her that and i did all of those things so then i'm in finally in albuquerque she says i want a divorce <laughs> I mean, I I did everything I said I was supposed to do. Hey, I'm a guy, you know? That's the way guys think. I say I'm going to do this, and I do it. No, no, of course not that simple. There are hidden dimensions involved, Sean. Hidden dimensions. <laughs> if you don't pay attention to the hidden dimensions, you're toast. I mean, just like if you don't believe in the hidden fifth dimension then that means you don't believe in electromagnetism you only believe in gravity well that makes a lot of this stuff i've seen really hard to explain you ever gone through a good lightning storm in wisconsin then you believe in electromagnetism you know mm -hmm. i lived in florida and the lightning people got hit by lightning a lot in florida but the lightning was of a cheap Kmart variety. I mean, really, uh, it, it would put you in the hospital. It wouldn't kill you. Mm -hmm. And the secretary at my space institute where I worked for the University of Florida, she'd actually seen somebody get hit by lightning on the beach. The lifeguards on the beach told everybody, clear off the beach, there's a lightning storm coming. And this one idiot stood there on the beach and he got hit by lightning. So they went out there, got him, got him to a hospital, and unfortunately, he survived. You know, it's just sheer stupidity. Lightning hit people a lot because there's nothing. Florida is as flat as Kansas, and there are no mountains. Not even the trees are very tall because the hurricanes come along and blow over tall trees. So it's, everything is fairly flat and level in Florida. So basically... Lightning is very common, but it doesn't seem to hurt anybody. It kills people, but most of the time, it just puts you in the hospital for a few days. But you move to Wisconsin and or Texas, the lightning here, if it hits you, all they'll find is your shoes. <laughs> you know, the lightning here is really powerful, and it was up in Wisconsin, too. Mm -hmm. You did not screw around with a lightning storm. You didn't stand outside and watch it. No. You stay indoors. You stay away from the windows, even, because the lightning can come right through the panes of glass on the windows. And turn stuff. So that's electromagnetism. So if you don't believe in electromagnetism, you're toast during a lightning storm. So you have to believe in the fifth dimension, because the fifth dimension gives you electromagnetism, where before all you had was gravity. What the fifth mm -hmm. dimension does physically is... It takes something that is basically operating at the deep quantum mechanical scale, the Planck length, deep quantum mechanics, very short wavelengths where the wave nature of matter and fields is very apparent. In our present world that we live in, we don't see quantum mechanics. That's why it took a long time to discover it. This ain't a wave. It's a coffee cup. So gravity is actually operating in electromagnetism at that fine a scale the quantum mechanical level of electromagnetism is what gives you gravity what the fifth dimension does is it like suddenly allows electromagnetic fields to be big where before they were small instead of the micro suddenly you have macro fields big magnetic fields, big electric fields. In fact, if you're standing on a beach during a lightning storm, you learn that the hard way. So the fifth dimension gives you electromagnetism, even though it exists as a micro scale. Oh, then the secret to all of this is the number 42. The number 42, as it turns out, and this was worked out by another German physicist named Lenz, spelled with a Z, Wilhelm Lenz, it was right after World War II. Here's the cities are ruined. 
Um, you know, my father bombed Nazi Germany during World War II. He was very proud of it when he did it, and then later in life, he felt guilty about it, blowing up all those women and kids. But it was a war. But anyway, so this guy's in 1951. He's looking at the measurements of the proton mass to the electron mass, and it's the ratio of 1836 point like one five. For some reason, he discovers that this is given almost exactly the 13 parts per million, close enough for government work, by the number six times pi, you know, pi as in apple pie, you know, round, pi to the fifth power. Pi to the fifth power. I don't even know how he calculated it back in 1951. That's a hard number to calculate. Anyway, six times pi to the fifth gives you the ratio of the proton and electron mass. And then you take the square root of that and gives you 42, which is the center of my gem theory. I kept thinking, why this number 42? And why is it the square root of six times pi to the fifth power? I found it, and that's what's in my latest article. The secret to 42 being the square root of 6 times pi to the fifth power is from quantum mechanics. Max Planck, the great German physicist who got the Nobel Prize, he invented quantum mechanics. He figured out what's called the black body curve. The curve of radiance versus wavelength. Mm -hmm. If you have some steel, you heat it, it glows dull red. You heat it some more, it gets red hot. It's bright red. Heat it some more, it turns orange. Finally, it turns yellow. Finally, it's white hot. You keep heating it, by the way. Of course, the steel melts by the time it's white hot. If you keep heating it, it turns blue hot, like an acetylene torch. That's the black body spectrum. The wavelength of the light, where the peak of the light is, gets to shorter and shorter wavelengths as you get things get hotter. Planck figured this all out. He also figured out how much energy, if you have a piece of iron, at a certain temperature, how much energy does it radiate? How fast does it cool off? You pull a chunk of white hot steel out of the furnace, how long before you can touch it? Well, as it turns out, it cools off because of radiation. It radiates visible light, finally infrared light, finally just radio waves. You can feel the heat when it's just infrared light, even though you can't see the light from it anymore. You can feel it on your palm of your hand. Finally, if you're smart, you hold your hand up close to it. If you don't feel any heat from it, you know you can handle it. If you're really clever, you sprinkle a little water on it, see if the water evaporates. But if the water doesn't evaporate, then you know it's safe to handle. Okay, the thing that the physics that determines that curve of spectrum radiance is called the Planck distribution. It's called the black body, and it was worked out by Max Planck. He had to invent quantum mechanics to explain it. He invented Planck's constant to explain that. When you combine everything and you want to know the amount of energy radiated by one chunk of steel that's white hot, if you know its temperature, you can actually predict how much energy it radiates per unit of surface. And that is called, it goes as T to the fourth power times what's called the Stefan Boltzmann constant because it was measured in the laboratory. Planck worked it out exact using quantum mechanics. He got the precise number that they got in the lab. But before that, they just measured in the lab. They said, gee, if you have a piece of hot steel, it radiates this much power. It's the T it goes to the T to the fourth power, and it has multiplied by the Stefan Boltzmann. 
Stefan Bolfus and Connors just a number, experimental number. Then Planck showed you could derive it from quantum mechanics. And sitting in the middle of the Stefan Boltzmann constant is six times pi to the fifth power. So six times pi to the fifth power, which is the secret to the proton electron mass, in my theory, comes from quantum mechanics. Say the electron is just a particle, it's cold. The proton is three quarks racing around in there, banging around inside. It's hot. You estimate a temperature from uh, nuclear physics, the rest mass of the pi meson. You know what size the proton is. The proton is actually the same size as an electron, except the electron isn't supposed to have a size. It's just the size you get mathematically. The proton, you can measure its size using nuclear scattering. They turn out to be the same number, same size. So if you say there's a sphere the size of an electron, and you imagine these quarks bouncing around inside each other, and they're radiating gluon fields that are uh, follow the Planck distribution, out falls six times pi to the fifth because of the Stefan Boltzmann constant, which was worked out in detail by Planck. So the thing that makes the gem theory work and the number 42 is the same thing that gives you the light of the stars, the light of the sun, it gives you the light of a campfire and the warmth you feel standing next to another human body. Same physics. The proton is white hot. And all its energy and mass, and mass equals energy, all its energy is in those fields. And they're obeying Planck's distribution. So that's where you get six times five. Of the fifth. So the gem theory with this number 42 is actually derived from the most fundamental quantum mechanical theory of electromagnetism. So that's what's in my article. I just got published in India. And I fully expect to get the Nobel Prize for this article. I mean, I'm going to get the Nobel Prize for physics, and then I'll also get the Nobel Prize for physics for literature, because I wrote Morningstar Pass, The Collapse of the UFO cover where these two babes hey they're news anchors they're two gorgeous babes one's this hot blonde another's this hot chinese american from san diego the blonde grew up in cleveland <laughs> she started out as a weather girl in cleveland anyway they bring down the ufo cover-up in in my novel and so that's what's going to get the no me the nobel prize for literature <laughs> It, hey, it's just the coffee. It, it's the coffee talking here. It's the coffee. Yeah. There's the gem theory. As much as I understand about it, and it says yes, we can build our own flying saucers. We can build our own warp drive. Everything is possible. The world of Star Trek lies ahead of us, and we're gonna do fine, Sean. We're gonna do fine with God, guts, and guns. We'll get through this situation. And I love your suggestion. This was an Orion nuclear drive that for something went wrong. Something went wrong. Hey, yeah, just, just just explain that real quick because we didn't we didn't really talk about. Okay, it. Okay, yeah. Maybe. Now the Avi Loeb, his real name is Abraham. Abraham Loeb, trained by the Mossad. <laughs> Apparently, he got put through graduate school by the Mossad, the Israeli intelligence, because they thought he was a really smart guy. He ends up being the head of the astronomy department at harvard he does a great job the guy is really smart so th there was this asteroid that flew by the earth and it was 10 times longer than it was wide it's very odd it wasn't an asteroid it was a needle out in space and it flew past us and as it came from the sun side you know it came down out of the sun flew past us and then we only detected it after it had flown past us I mean, it didn't fly by that close. It flew by several times the distance to the moon, I guess. And then it sped up once we started bouncing radar off. 
it, the thing spat up. Explain that. So anyway, so Avi Loeb gets really intrigued by this. And then he thinks, well, maybe it was an interstellar spacecraft sent to investigate us. Everybody told him, quit talking about that, Abby. And he says, go ahead and fire me from being the head of the department. I got tenure. He, he says, he says, I hope they do fire me because I'm tired of all the busy work involved in being head of this department. I want to just go back to my office and just do physics, you know, astrophysics. So then he finds out that the Space Command watched something fall into the atmosphere of the Earth going 45 kilometers a second. Most meteorites, when they hit the Earth, they come in at about 11 kilometers a second. Basically, escape velocity, free fall time, free fall speed. This thing came in almost five times faster than anything they'd ever seen. And when it hit the atmosphere at night over the Pacific near Pow Pow, New Guinea, it made a big fireball, and they take home movies from these spy satellites. They were watching this as spy satellites. This thing not only lit up the whole sky, it lasted a long time. It got deep into the atmosphere. Most meteorites burn up very high in the atmosphere. This thing lasted until a couple thousand feet above the ocean, apparently. And then broke up into a bunch of flaming junk, molten junk, melted, broke up into a bunch of flaming droplets that then ended up in the ocean. So Loeb says 45 kilometers a second, that's basically the speed that something from another star system would arrive here. Maybe it's an interstellar meteorite. So all the meteorites we all get, they all sit in museums, are all from the solar system. They have the same isotopes as everything, especially iron. Iron has like five isotopes, the most stable element, so it has like five isotopes. You can see the fingerprint is the same for everything in the solar system. He gets some money together from some rich backer. They go out to Pow Pow New Guinea. They send a magnetic carpet sweeper down on the bottom of the ocean. They pick up little iron balls, apparently left by this thing that came in. Now, automatically, they're sorting. They're biasing the thing. They're only picking up the magnetic stuff, little iron balls. So they pick up all these iron balls. They bring them home. They analyze them. Sure enough, they look at the iron isotopes. This thing is not from this solar system. It's from a different star system because the isotopes are different. They don't match the fingerprint, isotopic fingerprint for any iron in this place. So then they do an analysis on what the, is in the spheres. Here's the weird thing. They're full of, you know, iron, obviously, because they got picked up with a magnet. So that kind of biases you're only looking at the stuff that's iron rich. It's full of titanium and aluminum. Mm -hmm. There's no meteorites like that. They're usually, if they got iron and they got nickel too. This one has hardly any nickel. It's iron, titanium, and aluminum are its major constituents. That's really strange. That looks like an aerospace alloy. That does not look like a meteor at all. And they also noticed this thing was really strong. Whatever came in was much stronger than a regular meteorite that breaks up. This thing lasted a long time, especially considering how fast it was going. So this thing looks, if you do an analysis, and they just published a paper where they showed everything they found inside the stuff. It was full of titanium and aluminum along with it. So it was basically melted titanium aluminum steel alloy with some chrome and vanadium thrown in there which are normal alloy this kinds of alloy is used by the way for the aircraft landing gear on uh, jet aircraft because mm -hmm. it's so strong and it, it resists shock so then they find something really weird about this 
it's full of a metal called beryllium. Beryllium is very rare. It's the big loser. When stars are making elements, new elements, they tend to make a lot of iron. They make helium. Of course, they make helium. They make oxygen. They make iron. When stars die, they have a heart of iron. Once you get iron, you can't make any more nuclear energy. It's all... So, and then, of course, the stars explode and they make things like all the way out to uranium, and thorium, really heavy stuff. But as it turns out, beryllium and lithium are two rather rare elements. They lose out on the big nuclear physics crap game. They crap out really early. So you hardly have, when you get a meteorite from outer space, you don't find hardly any beryllium in it or any lithium. You can find a whole mixture of stuff that apparently made the solar system. And lithium and beryllium are very rare. The other thing that's very rare is uranium and thorium. Of course, you would expect them to be very rare because they're very heavy. It takes a big furnace to make those kinds of things. So there's two very rare groups of elements. There's a lithium and beryllium are very, very rare in meteorites. And Thorium and uranium are also very rare in meteorites because they're rare everything. So they do an analysis on the sphere. Not only has it got all this titanium and aluminum in it, along with steel, it's got a bunch of beryllium and lithium in it and uranium. And it's got some thorium in there too. And these things stick out like sore thumbs. You've got stuff from the very rare elements from the very bottom of the periodic table, you know, the top of the periodic table, the light stuff, beryllium, lithium, very light. And then you've got uranium and thorium, the heaviest things. And they're both spikes in the element distribution of this spheroids. Plus, in the middle range of atomic weight is aluminum, titanium, and steel. So it's like this thing was made out of aerospace alloy, aluminum, barrel aluminum, titanium alloy, came into the atmosphere, melted, broke up into droplets, and got into the ocean. But then how do you explain the beryllium, lithium, and uranium, and some thorium? It's very strange. And it came in so fast. It was very odd, very odd. So finally you say, okay, maybe it was an alien spacecraft that got in some kind of technical difficulty, just like the Russian space probe that crashed in the moon. We're so sorry about that. I, I'm sorry. We're so sorry to hear about that mm -hmm. happening. You know, we're so sorry to hear about that happening to the Russians. And they made a nice crater, though. They got to name the crater after the Russian scientist who was in charge, who apparently jumped out of a window, he was so upset about this whole thing. So you got this aerospace alloy, melted aerospace, and then the middle of it, is melted beryllium and lithium and uranium. I'm sorry. I recognize that too, because I spent nine and a half years in nuclear weapons labs. Those look like melted components of a hydrogen bomb. Now, why would an alien spacecraft be carrying hydrogen bombs? Well, especially the way it came in, it could be Orion Drive. This was first proposed by a bunch of nuclear physicists, as Ted Taylor proposed this, you could set off a series of atomic bombs and get a spacecraft up near the speed of light so it could travel in between star systems. Maybe that's what this was. Maybe somebody sent a probe from another star system using this Orion drive, a series of nuclear weapons, and they had a series of nu nuclear bombs that was supposed to slow them down when they got near the Earth. But for some reason, there was a, some problem. Some problem occurred. And instead of slowing down, going into Earth orbit, they ended up just augering in. Hey, we all know about that. Anybody who's a pilot knows somebody who's augered in. Let's assume there wasn't anybody on it. It was just a probe, and it was powered by Orion Drive. Bunch of nuclear bombs. And nuclear bombs didn't get all used up because they couldn't uh, do the braking maneuver that we were supposed to. So they came in, basically 
at 30 kilometers a second and then the earth's gravity added another 11 kilometers a second. they came in at 45 kilometers a second and hit the atmosphere so let's suppose it was interstellar pro powered by orion drive there that what, else, would what did you think it was before i mentioned the orion drives you know i'm a science fiction writer hey and and, I, and, and not that you're i'm not saying you're wrong i'm just saying hey could have been the klingons you know flying around uh, a starship with a bunch of nuclear weapons on board could have been that and they augured it who knows but i like the orion drive better because it's we're all trying to make nice there's a saying i heard several times in the aerospace business never attribute to malice what can be explained by incompetence <laughs> That yeah. pretty much describes most everything, right? That describes most everything. A lot of this stuff, no, people weren't doing it out of malice. It was just stupidity. It could be just a probe that was supposed to explore the Earth. I mean, we make a lot of noise. We would attract a lot of attention. So they sent an Orion drive here, and it was supposed to slow down when it got near the Earth, but uh, something went wrong. So it, the brakes failed. The brakes didn't work. And the brakes turned out to be, uh, well, like it got boosted up to light speed by nuclear bombs. And then they had some nuclear bombs to slow down. And those didn't work for some reason. So it was an unfortunate action. It was incompetence. There was nothing malicious about it. They weren't sneaking around here with a bunch of nuclear bombs on board. They were just trying to pay us a visit. And something went wrong. They never got to, uh, so anyway, so it all burned up in the atmosphere. So I love this idea. It was an Orion drive that went wrong. No malice involved, only colossal incompetence. We hope. We hope. We, hey, I write science fiction. My science fiction tends to be women in tight spacesuits and swashbuckling uh, stuff and space battles and Hey, Star Wars, Star Wars and Star Trek. Those are my two favorite science fiction genres. So, Sean, I think that's a good explanation. I agree. And uh, this is a good explanation. And tongues will wag about this, but they won't. What I don't want is people just walking away quietly. Oh. We don't like that idea. We're not going to talk about it. No, this is the Orion Drive. Hey, it may inspire us to try and build an Orion Drive ourselves. Wouldn't that be fun? They tried back in the 60s, right? They did a successful experiment. They used TNT charges. Yeah, because yeah, it may that. have like wiped out the atmosphere if they were firing well, hydrogen that, bombs to launch into space. It required a lot of nuclear bombs going off, and they were trying to sign a test ban treaty. So, you know, because they were building up a big radioactive layer in the uh, atmosphere. Ted Taylor was convinced that he had to sacrifice his great idea. But now we could do it. So I have suddenly become a proponent of the Orion Drive. How about that? <laughs> All right, my friend. It's you're the real genius, Sean, for pointing no, that I'm not. out. I'm just a oh, moron who just genius. remembers things. Hey, hey, you didn't get to be an army officer for nothing. In fact, you were probably too smart to rise any farther. <laughs> yeah, probably. Well, I mean, anyway, I, I just, that's not, go, that's not go. Well, anyway, Sean, that's, it's been a marvelous discussion. And yeah, we, you got a lot of stuff to work with here. I certainly but do. I love you. I love your Orion Drive thing. And you're going to hear me crowing about it. <laughs> How about that? I got All Texas right, Dragon Rights. This was my idea. I'm going to present it at the upcoming. Just say it's huh? your idea. I mean, it's out It's out in the open. I don't. You know. oh, 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 no, no. I, well, I'll just, I'll just say it was suggested. You, you, you don't want me using your name? You can, yeah, you can use my name. Okay. It was sure. a suggestion of uh, Sean, Sean Hazlitt that uh, this is an Orion Drive probe from a nearby star system using Orion Drive. And I love it. Everyone will love this idea. And it may inspire us to try and try it ourselves. 
I think we're working on it. I think NASA's actually working on something like that. I, I think so. And they tested the Orion Drive using just conventional explosives. It worked great. Yeah. And they would have had to test things in the atmosphere. We can put stuff out in space now and test it out in space. And as yeah. long as yeah, I think that's the plan. You 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 assemble all this stuff out in space. And oh, then, oh yeah, and then you fire the hydrogen bombs, and you make sure this is all an internationally supervised thing. You know, yeah. and I think this is a wonderful. I'll be proposing this project. How about well, now? That? You'll be able to sleep tonight. <laughs> I can sleep tonight. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Sean. <laughs> Because it's not like a natural, it's not like a natural nuclear reactor, which has a completely dis different signature. Like this has yeah. the exact same signature. This of has the exact bomb. same signature, exact same yeah. signature. And so this is, uh, this is just great. This is just great. Okay, Sean, I'm going to let you go. Or, you know, do you have anything else you want to ask? No, I think we covered a lot of ground. The answer I is 42. You. 42. Yeah. I appreciate you. By the way, and, uh, 42 comes from Alice in Wonderland. All people want taller than a mile high must leave the courtroom. It's about scales. And that's what, of course, Grandis and Medianus. The Grandis can't talk to the Medianus, which is the king. He's only, uh, he's short for his size anyway. So he tells Alice that she has to leave the courtroom because she's now a mile high. And she says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Your Majesty. <laughs> anyway, Sean, always great to talk to you. We'll talk some more. Absolutely. About we'll talk about Orion, the proposal for the Orion Drive that I'm now going to make. Oh, and the person who's going to be really happy is Abby Bob. He'll realize suddenly he inspired people to do something really interesting, something truly worthy. Excellent. So, very good. Right. I'll let you go. Okay, Sean. Take thank care. Thank you, my friend. Now. Thank okay. you, my thank you for a wonderful interview. Bye-bye. Bye bye. If you enjoyed this video, please click on like, subscribe, and the notification button so that you're alerted anytime I post something new.